The Events at Porath Farm Written by T. E. D. Klein Performed by Scott MacDonald As soon as the phone stops ringing, I'll begin this affidavit. Lord, it's hot in here. Perhaps I should open a window. Thirteen rings. It has a sense of humor. I suppose that ought to be comforting. Somehow I'm not comforted. If it feels free to indulge in these teasing, tormenting little games, so much the worse for me. The summer is over now, but this room is like an oven. My shirt is already drenched, and this pen feels slippery in my hand. In a moment or two, the little drop of sweat that's collecting above my eyebrow is going to splash onto this page. Just the same? I'll keep that window closed. Outside, through the dusty panes of glass, I can see a boy in red spectacles sauntering toward the courthouse steps. Perhaps there's a telephone booth in back. <laughs> a sense of humor. That's one quality I never noticed in it. I saw only a deadly seriousness and, of course, an intelligence that grew at terrifying speed, malevolent and inhuman. If it now feels itself safe enough to toy with me before doing whatever it intends to do, so much the worse for me, perhaps for us all. I hope I'm wrong. Though my name is Jeremy, derived from Jeremiah, I'd hate to be a prophet in the wilderness. I'd much rather be a harmless crank. But I believe we're in for trouble. I'm a long way from the wilderness now, of course, though perhaps not far enough to save me. I'm writing this affidavit in room 2K of the Union Hotel, overlooking Main Street in Flemington, New Jersey, twenty miles south of Gilead. Directly across the street, hippies lounging on its steps, stands the county courthouse where Bruno Hoffman was tried back in 1935. Did they ever find the body of that child? Hoffman undoubtedly walked down those very steps, now lined with teenagers savoring their last week of summer vacation. Where that boy in the red spectacles sits sucking on his cigarette, did the killer once halt there, police and reporters around him, and contemplate his imminent execution? For several days now I have been afraid to leave this room. I have, perhaps, been staring too often at that ordinary-looking boy on the steps. He sits there every day. The red spectacles conceal his eyes. It's impossible to tell where he's looking. I know he's looking at me. But it would be foolish of me to waste time worrying about executions when I have these notes to transcribe. It won't take long, and then perhaps I'll sneak outside to mail them and leave New Jersey forever. I remain, despite all that's happened an optimist. What was it my namesake said? Thou art my hope in the day of evil? There is, surprisingly, some real wilderness left in New Jersey, assuming one wants to be a prophet. The hills to the west, spreading from the southern swamplands to the Delaware and beyond to Pennsylvania, provide shelter for deer, pheasant, even an occasional bear, and hide hamlets never visited by outsiders, pockets of ignorance, some of them citadels of ancient superstition, utterly cut off from news of New York and the rest of the state, religious communities where customs haven't changed appreciably since the days of their settlement a century or more ago. It seems incredible that villages so isolated can exist today on the very doorstep of the world's largest metropolis. Villages with nothing to offer the outsider and hands never visited, except by the occasional hunter who stumbles on them unwittingly. 
that as you speed down one of the state highways, consider how few of the cars slow down for the local roads. It is easy to pass the little towns without even a glance at the signs, and if there are no signs. And consider, too, how seldom the local traffic turns off onto the narrow roads that emerge without warning from the woods. And when those untraveled side roads lead into others still deeper in wilderness, and when those, in turn, give way to dirt roads deserted for weeks on end, it is not hard to see how tiny rural communities can exist less than an hour from major cities, virtually unaware of one another's existence. Television, of course, will link the two, unless, as is often the case, the elders of the community choose to see this distraction as the devil's tool and proscribe it. Telephones put these outcast settlements in touch with their neighbors, unless they choose to ignore their neighbors, and so in the course of years they are forgotten. New Yorkers were amazed when, in the winter of 1968, the Times discovered a religious community near New Providence that had existed in its present form since the late 1800s, less than 40 miles from Times Square. Agricultural work was performed entirely by hand. Women still wore long dresses with high collars, and town worship was held every evening. I, too, was amazed. I'd seldom traveled west of the Hudson and still thought of New Jersey as some dismal extension of the Newark slums, ruled by gangsters, foggy with swamp gases and industrial waste, a gray land that had surrendered to the city. Only later did I learn of the rural New Jersey and of towns whose solitary general stores double as post offices with one or two gas pumps standing in front and later still I learned of Baptist Town and Quaker Town, their old religion surviving unchanged, and of towns like Lebanon, Lansdon, and West Portal, close to Route 22 and civilization, but heavy with secret city folk never dreamed of. Mount Airy, with its network of hidden caverns, and Mount Olive, bordering the infamous Bud Lake, Middle Valley, sheltered by dark cliffs, subject of the recent archaeological debate chronicled in natural history, where the wanderer may still find grotesque relics of pagan worship, and, some say, may still hear the chants that echo from the cliffs on certain nights, and towns with names like Zion and Zarephath and Gilead, forgotten communities of bearded men and black-robed women, walled hamlets too small or obscure for most maps of the state. This was the wilderness into which I traveled, weary of Manhattan's interminable din, and it was outside Gilead where, until the tragedies, I chose to make my home for three months. Among the silliest of literary conventions is the town that won't talk, the Bavarian village where Peasants turn away from tourist queries about the castle and silently cross themselves. The New England harbor town where fishermen feign ignorance and cast furtive glances at the traveler. In actuality, I have found country people love to talk to the stranger, provided he shows a sincere interest in their anecdotes. Storekeepers will interrupt their activity at the cash register to tell you their theories on a recent murder. Farmers will readily spin tales of buried bones and of a haunted house down the road. Rural townspeople are not so reticent as the writers would have us believe. Gilead. Isolated though it is behind its oak forests and ruined walls is no exception. The inhabitants regard all outsiders with an initial suspicion but let one demonstrate a respect for their traditional reserve and they will prove friendly enough. They don't favor modern fashions or flashy automobiles, but they can hardly be described as hostile, although that was my original impression. 
When asked about the terrible events at Porath Farm, they will prove more than willing to talk. They will tell you of bad crops and polluted well water, of emotional depression leading to a fatal argument. In short, they will describe a conventional rural murder and will even volunteer their opinions on the killer's present whereabouts. But you will learn almost nothing from them, or almost nothing that is true. They don't know what really happened. I do. I was closest to it. I had come to spend the summer with Sar Porath and his wife. I needed a place where I could do a lot of reading without distraction, and Porath's farm, secluded as it was even from the village of Gilead, six miles down the dirt road, appeared the perfect spot for my studies. I had seen the Porath's advertisement in the Hunterton County Democrat on a trip west through Princeton last spring. They advertised for a summer or long-term tenant to live in one of the outbuildings behind the farmhouse. As I soon learned, the building was a long, low cinder block affair, unpleasantly suggestive of army barracks, but clean, new, and cool in the sun. By the start of summer, ivy sprouted from the walls and disguised the ugly gray brick. Originally intended to house chickens, it had in fact remained empty for several years until the farm's original owner, a Mr. Baber, sold out last fall to the Poroths, who immediately saw that, with the installation of dividing walls, linoleum floors, and other improvements, the building might serve as a source of income. I was to be their first tenant. The Poroths, Sar and Deborah were in their early thirties, only slightly older than I, although anyone who met them might have believed the age difference to be greater. Their relative solemnity and the drabness of their clothing added years to their appearance, and so did their hairstyles. Deborah, though possessing a beautiful length of black hair, wound it all in a tight bun behind her neck pulling the hair back from her face with a severity which looked almost painful. And Sar maintained a thin fringe of black beard that circled from ears to chin in the manner of the Pennsylvania Dutch who leave their hair shaggy but refuse to grow mustaches lest they resemble the military class they've traditionally despised. Both man and wife were hard-working, grave of expression, and pale, despite the time spent laboring in the sun, a pallor accentuated by the inky blackness of their hair. I imagine this unhealthy aspect was due, in part, to the considerable amount of inbreeding that went on in the area, the Poroths themselves being, I believe, third cousins. On first meeting, one might have taken them for brother and sister, two gravely devout children aged in the wilderness. And yet there was a difference between them, and too a difference that set them both in contrast to others of their sect. The Poroths were, as far as I could determine, members of a tiny Mennonite order, outwardly related to the Amish, though doctrinal differences were apparently rather profound. It was this order that made up the large part of the community known as Gilead. I sometimes think the only reason they allowed an infidel like me to live on their property, for my religion was among the first things they inquired about, was because of my name. Sar was very partial to Jeremiah, and the motto of his order was, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein. Having been raised in no particular religion except a universal skepticism, I began the summer with a hesitancy to raise the topic in conversation, and so I learned comparatively little about the Poroth's beliefs. Only toward the end of my stay did I begin to thumb through the Bible in odd moments and take to quoting Jeremy ads. That was, I suppose, Sarah's influence. I was able to learn, nonetheless, that for all their conservative aura, 
The Poroths were considered, in effect, young liberals by most of Gilead. Sar had a bachelor's degree in religious studies from Rutgers, and Deborah had attended a nearby community college for two years, unusual for women of the sect. Two, they had only recently taken to farming, having spent the first year of their marriage near New Brunswick, where Sar had hoped to find a teaching position, and when the job situation proved hopeless, had worked as a sort of handyman carpenter. While most inhabitants of Gilead had never left the farm, the Poroths were coming to it late. Their families had been merchants for several generations and so were relatively inexperienced. The inexperience showed. The farm comprised some ninety acres, but most of that was forest or fields of weeds too thick and high to walk through. Across the backyard, close to my rooms, ran a small nameless stream, nearly choked with green scum. A large cornfield to the north lay fallow, but Sar was planning to seed it this year, using borrowed equipment. His wife spent much of her time indoors, for though she maintained a small vegetable garden, she preferred keeping house and looking after the Poroth's great love, their seven cats. As if to symbolize their broad-mindedness, the Poroths owned a television set, very rare in Gilead. In light of what was to come, however, it is unfortunate they lacked a telephone. Apparently the set had been received as a wedding present from Deborah's parents, but the monthly expense of a telephone was simply too great. Otherwise, though, the little farmhouse was modern in that it had a working bathroom and gas heat. That they advertised in the local newspaper was considered scandalous by some of the order's more orthodox members, and indeed, a mere subscription to that innocuous weekly had at one time been regarded as a breach of religious conduct. Though outwardly similar, both of them tall and pale, the Poroths were actually so different as to embody the maxim that opposites attract. It was that carefully nurtured reserve that deceived one at first meeting, for in truth Deborah was far more talkative, friendly, and energetic than her husband. Sar was moody, distant, silent most of the time, with a voice so low that one had trouble following him in conversation. Sitting as stonily as one of his cats, never moving, never speaking, perennially inscrutable, he tended to frighten visitors to the farm until they learned that he was not really sitting in judgment on them. His reserve was not born of surliness, but of shyness. Where Sar was cat-like, his wife hid beneath the formality of her order the bubbly personality of a kitten. Given the smallest encouragement, say a family visit, she would plunge into animated conversation, gesticulating, laughing easily, hugging whatever cat was nearby, or shouting to guests across the room. When drinking, for both of them enjoyed liquor, and curiously, it was not forbidden by their faith, their innate differences were magnified. Deborah would forget the restraints placed upon women in the order and would eventually dominate the conversation, while her husband would seem to grow increasingly withdrawn and morose. Women in the region tended to be submissive to the men, and certainly the important decisions in the Poroth's lives were made by Sar. Yet I really cannot say who was the stronger of the two. Only once did I ever see them quarrel. Perhaps the best way to tell it is by setting down portions of the journal I kept this summer. Not every entry, of course. Mere excerpts. Just enough to make this affidavit comprehensible to anyone unfamiliar with the incidents at Poroth Farm. The journal was the only writing I did all summer. My primary reason for keeping it was to record the books I'd read each day, as well as to examine my reactions to relative solitude over a long period of time. All the rest of my energies, as you will no doubt gather from the notes below, were spent reading, in preparation for a course I plan to teach at Trenton State this fall, or 
planned, I should say, because I don't expect to be anywhere around here come fall. Where will I be? Perhaps that depends on what's beneath these rose-tinted spectacles. The chorus was to cover Gothic tradition, from Shakespeare to Faulkner, from Hamlet to Absalom Absalom, and why not view the former as Gothic, with its ghost on the battlements and concern for lost inheritance? To make the move to Gilead, I'd rented a car for a few days and had stuffed it full of books, only a few of which I ever got to read. But then I couldn't have known. How pleasant things were at the beginning. 